Good morning. Today is the 31st day of January 2016, and we are very pleased to have Kitu Reddy back with us. Welcome, Kitu. Namaskar. Uh, Kitu did five talks with us previously, and his students were very moved by them. He spoke on the ashram, he spoke on the center of education, and today he is going to speak on the foundations of Indian culture and India today, perhaps, we can speak a bit about. As it comes along. Good, good. What do you feel, what can you tell us about India, the situation today in India? in the light of Sri Aurobindo? <clears throat> I will answer that question a little later. Mm -hmm. What I will do is uh, first give you a broad introduction to the background of this book. Good. Now this book was written during the years 1918-1920 uh, some 30 odd chapters <coughs> in reply, apparently, to a book written by a gentleman called Mr. William Archer, a dramatic literary critic from England, who apparently was hired by the British government to denounce India's claim for freedom. So there was a political motive which Ravindra refers to in the very first chapter. The political motive came because when the First World War broke out, the Allies, that is England, France, who were colonial countries, were speaking about the dignity and freedom of nations. Now when you speak of the dignity and freedom of nations, but do not give that same freedom to the colonies, it is very embarrassing. So they had to justify it by saying uh, that India is unfit for freedom. It's a barbaric nation. And therefore, when the time comes, we'll probably give it. So Mr. Archer was asked to write a book with a very clear political intention to show that India is not a civilized nation still in the throes of barbarism. Now, as soon as he wrote this book, <coughs> there was another Englishman, really an Irishman, Sir John Woodruff, who had settled now in India, who had become a great lover of India, in fact identified himself with India, and was a practitioner of the Tantric philosophy. Sri speaks very highly of him. His name is Sir John Woodruff. So he replied to that book of Mr. William Archer by writing another book called Is India Civilized? Right. So when Sri starts this book, he starts by presenting Sir John Woodruff's Is India Civilized? Three chapters where he speaks about uh, what he has presented, agreed almost on all points with minor modifications, right? Uh, very minor, but otherwise Sir John Woodruff was very much in tune with the deeper Indian thought. And then after that, there are a series of chapters. Now, since the modern man is essentially a mental being and wants everything to be ultimately judged by the rational standards. The first six chapters are a rationalistic critic of Indian culture. He is addressing the rational man, trying to make him understand the deeper elements, right, mm -hmm. through the reason. So it's a very interesting thing because he touches upon many areas, the social system, the caste system, etc., etc. It is wonderful. 
Then he moves on to four chapters or five chapters on religion and spirituality. Now this is above the mind, above reason. And so he covers the whole gamut of Indian spirituality starting right from the Vedic times, the Upanishadic times, the Gita, the Puranas, right up to the modern times. And this was written in 18 to 20, 1918 to 1920. 1918 to 1920. It was a, it's a brilliant piece. Then he takes up four chapters on Indian art. And he is very clear about it, that the average, I will not use the word Westerner, but I will use the word the average individual who lives in his reason, will not be able to appreciate Indian art unless he remolds his vision completely. So you see, the very fact of looking at Indian art, you have to create a certain, you have to get into a certain psychological state. See, so there are four chapters. One is a general chapter on Indian art. The next three chapters are Indian architecture, Indian sculpture, and Indian painting. With detailed uh, uh, examples of certain architectural pieces, certain sculptural pieces, and certain paintings. Right? It is extremely enlightening. And it is very practical because I have... <clears throat> taken my students uh, for seeing Indian architecture to Gangai Konda Cholapuram. It's nearby. I couldn't have taken them further. Similarly, Indian sculpture you can also see there. Indian painting he has spoken of in very great detail, the Buddha meeting his wife and child. Now, painting is something which you can transport, which you can reproduce, but you can't transport a whole building. So you can see them in pictures here, and today the reproductions are excellent, right? So you get a real and almost three-dimensional nowadays, right? So four chapters in Indian art, then four chapters on Indian literature, or four or five chapters on Indian literature which is very interesting, again starting from the Vedas, Upanishads, right up to the regional literature, Sanskrit, classical literature, Sanskritic literature. And then four very important chapters, in my opinion, on Indian polity. Because <clears throat> the average man, and absolutely so in the West, believes that we have been a failure in life. In the political and social areas, we have not been a great success. He will show you exactly the contrary. That India has been a tremendous success. And uh, common sense should tell you that a civilization that has survived for 5,000 years could not have survived without having that basic organizational structure. There have been ups, there have been downs, there have been times when it seemed that we would be on the way out, right? But we have survived. And as Shirobinda says, somewhere in one of his uh, short, short comments, Hinduism has survived for 5,000 years and so it will survive for much longer because it is not such a fluffy thing, right? So you see now, this is where the whole thing has to be understood. If you look at it from another point of view, you will see that it is an integral approach to life. Right from the highest spirituality, which was followed by a certain amount of illusionism at a certain stage, which had neglected life, but that was a temporary period. But then afterwards, right down to art, literature, politics, society, organization. So in a certain way, Indian culture has always done exactly what Sri Aurobindo says, integral approach to life. And then after that, he wrote another chapter, a little later, and this is, in my opinion, extremely important today, Indian culture and external influence. Today, whether we like it or not, you cannot protect yourself by 
creating walls and barriers of non-communication. You are blasted. Yes. How do you face that? Normally when a mother or a father wants to protect their child, they keep them away from bad company. Today you can't keep them away. The internet is there, the social media is there. So the solution has to be from within. That is where the whole world today is facing this problem. Every civilization and culture is battered from all around. Yet you want to keep your identity. You know, this is a, an art where you don't close your windows, yet you remain yourself. It is a very interesting chapter and we can take it up in some detail at a certain stage. Right. So this is the whole book. Now, as I said, <coughs> this book was written as a reply to Mr. William Archer. I would say today that the problem is not the Westerners or the outsiders. It is we, the Indians themselves, particularly the intellectual class of India, who are an absolute disaster. They understand nothing of India. Their roots are completely cut off from India. And unfortunately, the education system that we have had for the last 150 years has completely destroyed the Indian's understanding of his own culture, getting back to his own roots, and therefore the pride. Therefore, most Indians in the schools and colleges, today it is very much better, but tend to imitate the successful West or anywhere, wherever there is success. And always success is measured by economic and political strength, right? Which is, which is very important, but it is not the basic thing. So for me, this book is no more a reply to the Western critics. It is a reply. It is rather a necessity for the Indian students to read it. And it's a reply to the intellectuals of Delhi, who are probably the biggest, <laughs> I won't use the word enemies, but who are the persons who least understand India. They are a minority, but they are a very vocal minority. And they are, in a certain sense, the opinion makers. Uh, but slowly, that is also because the social media today can completely undo what the TV channels do. So, and the social media is completely unregulated. So every time there is a false criticism, you will find at least 8 or 10 articles which give you different points of view. And if one goes to Twitter and Facebook and looks at all these things and all these points of view, you start getting a better picture. But then really in order to get a good picture, I think the whole education system needs an overhaul. And I believe that this book should be made compulsory in the higher classes of the school and the colleges. Uh, not the whole book. In fact, Sri Aurobindo himself has said that, I don't remember when, in the late 30s or early 40s, that he would have liked to revise the book. But this time, there would be no mention of Mr. Archer and his criticisms. Because it has been, I mean, he is bitingly sarcastic. If you see his sarcasm on Mr. William Archer, he tears him to bits, right? So he says, that era is over. Now we don't need to do that. Now it is we who have to understand our own yes. culture. So this is the basic thrust of the book. And from the point of view, it is, it is uh, for Indians today and for those who love India or, or in, are in contact with India, it's a very important book. Is it being taught in our school today, in knowledge? <clears throat> you see, in knowledge, <clears throat> the system is that those who want to can do it. Mm. It is not compulsory, which is in a way right. Um, many people do, t uh, I don't know many, but a few people do take it. But then that depth, they have to go into depth, right? And that is one of the difficulties today.
Today, I have many friends, Hindus, Brahmins also, who are appalled at what they see in the conversion by Christians of Hindus in India and how little um, Indians feel that they are Hindu. How many? How little they feel that they are truly Hindu. There's Muslims increasing uh, Christianity at a, a tremendous pace, uh, converting and proselytizing. Now, this is a political problem which has been deliberately created by the British. See, they have created two or three very serious problems. Uh, this division between differences between castes and Dalits, you know, it is they who made in their schedule 252 castes. Otherwise, nobody knew <laughs> that there are so many castes. They enumerated them and then suddenly you start, oh, I am a Dalit of this time, I am a Dalit of that time, I am a Dalit of that time. You are dividing. They've also used the Muslims and the Christians for political purposes. And see, it's a logical necessity. Christianity believes that there is one God and only one God and that is Jesus. Islam believes that there is one God and only one God and that is Allah and his prophet is Muhammad. Now when I believe that there is one God and only one God and you don't believe in that, out of sheer compassion I want you to believe that. <laughs> if it, is a, if it is the noblest motive, right? But it becomes very narrow. See, this is something which mother warned. Shurabindo and only Shurabindo and nothing but Shurabindo. It's an idiocy. Everybody has his approach. And if you read Shurabindo, Shurabindo takes all of them into his fold. So there is no need to, you know, propagandize. Right? So it is an inevitable trend of this I alone know the truth, right, to convert. The difference is that the Christians convert by missionary methods, the Muslim converts by force. Right? They use the sword, here they use uh, other methods, where a little bit of reason also enters. Right? Now, this has to be combated at the political level. Right? It cannot be combated merely by I mean, missionary activity must be stopped. Everyone has a right to practice his religion. You have every right to be a Christian. But you have no right to make me a Christian. And especially uh, the Peace Corps, which was sent in 1960s, when there was a famine in India. Under Kennedy. Uh, under Kennedy. Uh, they were outright missionaries. You are dying. I will give you food, but convert first. They converted. You know, this is very dirty politics, right? So, they have played this game. So, we have to stop this missionary activities. Everybody has a right to practice his religion. How can it be stopped other than education? No, I mean, the government has to pass a law. Ah, right. And then education. Education is a slow process. It will take 10 years, 15 years. But a law where anybody indulging in missionary activity is violating the law, and then the consequences will be there. Right? If that is done, right? but on the other hand, some of the Christian schools, some of the Christian hospitals at Velour, excellent. Right? You see, because they have that sense of charity and help and all that. Now, so there, is, there are very beautiful things in Christianity. That's why Shrivinda makes a very big difference between Judaic Christianity and Catholic Christianity. Oh. Judaic Christianity is centered around Christ, around love. And love doesn't compel, or it compels in a very subtle way. Right? Catholic Christianity is an organized religion. And the moment a religion is organized, that is the beginning of the end of the religion. 
because it it means an organizational structure right and the man at the top might not be a spiritual at all but he just happens to be the pope it is fortunate for christ for christianity that some of the popes have been very genuine but not all in fact not most yes. see that's why organized religion is a disaster and that is what has saved hinduism in uh, the southern united states we see tremendous force of evangelism yeah it is the same thing the same thing see that is why hinduism has been saved and that is why hindu shri govind says hinduism is not such a fluffy thing that it will disappear it has lasted 5000 years and it will last at least that much more it is only because there is no god who is who is the private property of the hindus there is no avatar who is belongs to the hindus there is no book soul simple book right there are so many things and each one has his own right to approach it in his own way it is absolutely integral and harmonized therefore you have the vaishnavas the shaivites the this the that the that all and we don't quarrel among ourselves it is only recently that uh, as a political stunt they are trying to make divisions but it will not and that's why this book is important because shivendra has defined hinduism and if we are asked what after all is hinduism he gives you three points <clears throat> i am not quoting but i can yes. of the cuff <clears throat> first the belief that there is a supreme something which has created the whole universe and which is manifest in this universe overtly or covertly and as a consequence of that the individual human being can unite himself with that supreme godhead so first thing is that i believe that there is a supreme creator who has created his whole manifestation and he is present in everything and i as a human being can discover that by uniting with him that is number 1 now how do i unite with him <clears throat> number 2 is there are hundreds and thousands of paths by which i can become one with god hundreds and thousands of paths already discovered and many yet more to be discovered so you see as vivekananda said every individual has his own religion so i have my approach to god and you look carefully it is a fact i have my approach to shobindo you have your approach to shobindo he has his approach to shobindo i have no right to tell you you should do it this way you have to understand you have to and it is based on your individual swadharma a typical indian word mm-hmm. right so there is a second characteristic of hinduism and the third characteristic is and this is he calls it the most important that this divine is not only up there it is right inside your heart this means that i don't have to look elsewhere i have to just look within and this is very interesting because mother herself said that when she was seeking for this and she met teon the answer but the divine is inside you and she said my god that came as a stunning revelation it is inside me then like a cyclone i plunged and i got the contact with the psychic being see otherwise is remote somewhere and here it is inside you right it's a huge difference it has a practical impact this is the essence of hinduism all the rest has its utility its place and some of them have been deformed but if you catch those deformations and those utilities and give it undue importance right then you are missing the whole thing so this is extremely important these three fundamentals right so that is why my total conviction is that this should be made available and the word compulsory is not nice but somehow everybody should study this in depth especially indians 
Because I can tell you, 85% of our problems will be solved when you understand India in the right way. If you understand Hinduism in this way, I, mean, I, can, I can't see why there will be any quarrel at all. I, for me, a Muslim is a Hindu. Because he also believes in God. And since there are hundreds and thousands of ways, he goes through the way of Allah. You go through the way of Christ. I go through the way of... Right? So you see, good understanding is so crucial to solving collective problems. So we are not encouraged to have politics in the ashram, but we have to know what is happening in the world. Yeah. How do you see America and India? You see, America <clears throat> was born as a revolt against the British. Therefore, their hallmark of the Americans, very strong, is individuality and freedom. Right? Yes. Because that is their birth. Yes. And starting from those 13 Confederate states, of course they expanded by all kinds of means, by force, etc. That is human nature. But that quality of freedom and individualism has remained intact. And it is so deep-rooted that I do not believe that whatever happens in America, it will become uh, eradicated. I don't think so. Now, this is for me an extremely important strength. We have to build on that. That they respect the individual, they respect freedom. Then economic strength, political policy, those, those are always changing and adjustable, that is all right. But if we can harp on this and develop our relationships on this level, I think it will be an extreme. There is a message of Srivabindo, a message to America. It is there in the in my old book, Srivabindo on himself. And some of his letters are there, right? And Srivabindo is harping on this all the time. So I believe that we are destined to be partners, right? And I remember that when I was working with the Indian Army, I used to tell General Joshi, who was the Army Chief, when he went to the United States to see the Pacific uh, fleet and all that, you know, he was invited there. So since I was very close to him, I told him, that you must stress on two things. The tremendous material success and perfection of America and the great spiritual success of India. These two should marry. So unfortunately, within two months after that, he passed away. But a very senior American diplomat in January, when he was giving a talk there, he said, you see, General Joshi told us that Materialism and spiritualism have to get marry and have a perfect world. What year was this approximately? Huh? What year approximately? Did, what year did uh, General Joshi go he to passed the away US? in 1994, November. Oh. Oh. And this talk was given in 1995. I was there in Delhi at that time. Mm -hmm. And I have interacted with the American Embassy, with the British Embassy. They were very responsive. You see, because you are not attacking them and all the time speaking of colonialism and all that. You say, look, you have developed an area of perfection. We have developed another area of perfection. We have to now come together and develop this. Work on a harmonious basis and not on a competitive basis. So it becomes a kind of competitive cooperation, if you mm -hmm. like to call it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kitu, how do you see Russia in this world view? See, Russia <clears throat> in 1917 underwent a huge churning and a crisis. It was inevitable. 
hundred years earlier, or a little more than hundred years, there was a violent revolution in France, the French Revolution, because of this huge gap between those who are powerful and those who are denied, the rich and the poor. The fact is that ninety-eight percent of the population of France owned 2% of the wealth and 2% of the population, aristocracy and the church, owned 98% of the wealth. This was intolerable. Therefore, there was an outburst and that resulted in the French Revolution, which gave three words which Rabindu says were inspired, liberty, equality and fraternity. But practically, on the ground level, the only thing that came forward was liberty of the nations. That too, not the whole of Europe, but a part of Europe. This is one of the dichotomy of the Western mind. They believed in liberty and dignity of the individual, but at the same time they believed in colonization and exploitation of the individual. So they had, you know, two pockets. In one pocket they believed in liberty, in the other pocket they continued the exploitation. <clears throat> now once liberty comes and these ideals are thrown into the air, it is not possible for man to remain unequal. And in Russia the inequality between the rich and the poor was enormous, right. huge. The agricultural class, the czars, that huge amount of land and all the rest were inevitably this idea. This is what Shravinda is always saying. The force of the idea is much stronger than anything else. So that idea had to find a place to manifest. And fortunately, a gentleman called Mark Karl Marx had written a book, which is an extremely interesting and enlightening book, where the main idea was equality has to be brought about in the state war of classes to be reduced by equality and he brought in the idea which is a very rational idea that left to himself the rich man or the powerful man will not bring about equality it has to be brought about by some kind of force so that is where the state comes in so you see now the state will take away your freedom to bring about equality. It is inevitable. Today every country in the world is moving in that direction. This is known as a socialistic, communistic movement, right? And Shobindo supports it wholeheartedly. In fact, in one of his aphorisms, he says, if I had to choose between communism and democracy, I would prefer communism. Because at least it respects the other individual. Democracy can be exploitation. Because I am powerful, I am rich, I am free. Right? But of course, it is a harmonization of these two that are concerned. So Russia embarked on this social revolution. Lenin, who guided the revolution from outside Russia, he was not in Russia when they, right? Well, they used uh, somewhat drastic methods. But you must understand why. See, when the idea of equality was thrown into the forefront, the Western countries did not like it at all, because they believed in liberty. And in Russia, the czars and the aristocratic class did not like it. So Russia had two enemies, internal and external. Right? Internal, because you are trying to reduce the gap between the rich and the poor. External, because they didn't want this idea to spread. They believed in democracy, freedom. So Russia was... Now, when you are faced with enemies like that, inevitable that there will be a compression of life. See, when there is a danger, then you organize yourself and fight back, right? So, inevitably, Russia moved in that direction. So, after the 1917 revolution, and after the quick departure of Latin, uh, Lenin, Stalin came into the picture and he centralized the whole thing in the most ruthless manner. 
by which he eliminated all those who were against him. I do not know the number and the figure, but I am told that millions of people were killed in Siberia. He will be able to tell you better, right? <clears throat> but this was an inevitable wrong step, undoubtedly, but it was an inevitable step in the right direction, in this sense that liberty is not enough. Equality is absolutely a must. And by equality, we don't, there are no two human beings were equal. That is a fact. But all human beings must be given the basic food, clothing, housing, education, opportunities for growth and development. After that, no equality. So if you don't understand equality in the right way, it will all go wrong. So Sri has got a whole sentence here where he says, fundamental equality and absolute equality. Absolute equality is neither desirable nor possible. But fundamental equality is an absolute must. Right? So Russia has contributed enormously in that direction. And naturally, like all human egos, they have spread their idea by force. I won't deny that. Russia has gone through a period of extreme compression. But then, you can't have equality without liberty. So inevitably, it would have come up. And that happened with the advent of Gorbachev. He brought in the idea of a fair amount of liberty, at the same time not giving up equality. So Russia now is in that state where it is weighing the, uh, you know, the pros and cons of liberty and equality. And since they've had a long history of state government and state control, they are still on that side. They are leaning a little more on that side. America is leaning a little more on that side. But you know, last Sunday when I was taking a class on the ideal of humanity, on the net, one American was uh, somewhat disturbed and she remarked that America is becoming socialistic, which means they are taxing the rich <laughs> to help the poor because there is now distinct poverty in America. There are people in winter who are sleeping in the streets, oh, yes. right? Is it the duty of the government to look after them or they can go to hell? Now, if I have to look after them, I have to tax the rich. I have to take from somewhere and give it to someone, no? Now, this inevitably will lead to socialism. So, America is very much de democratic with a little socialism. Russia is very socialistic with a little more democracy. India has tried to find a harmony between democratic socialism. Right? So, we are somewhere in the middle. And I believe that the present government, Narendra Modi, has, has one made a very fine balance. You see, when the before this government came, the public sector in India was given tremendous importance. That means under state control. It is in 1991 that Manmohan Singh, under Narasim Rao, privatized and began to encourage private growth, you know, that means private industries and all that. Now that is important. It is capitalist in its movement. It is also selfish. But if you want to have a bigger cake, you have to use that selfishness. Because if the cake is big, then I can distribute. But if I have a small cake, I can't distribute. So Sri says, don't kill the capitalistic structure. But at the same time, equality has to be brought in. So, continual balancing of these opposite ideas, right? And democratic socialism. And I think the present government has started moving in a very fine balance between state control and uh, private in initiative, right? And then there will be a very fine harmony, right? You see, this is very easy to understand. That is how I explain it to my students. Uh, the concept that I am giving is that the reason and the intellect can never give you the whole of the truth. 
it gives you one side of the truth. But life is not made up of one side of the truth. So now, do you believe in liberty? Or do you believe in order and discipline? Instinctively they say we believe in liberty. As you think about it. You would like to have liberty without order and discipline? No, no, no. Every order and discipline is a withdrawal of your liberty to a certain extent. So a good human life, a good human collectivity is a fine balance between liberty and order. If you can't do this, there will be chaos. But how much liberty and how much order will depend on the situation. If, as mother said once in a class, that if your students are all very serious and sincere, you can give them a lot of liberty. They will not misuse it. If it is a rowdy class, all the time making noise, then you have to impose discipline. So there is no formula. The formula is only this, that make a fine harmony between liberty and discipline. And each step you have to find out what to do when. Correct? So that is the whole... So there are two ideas that come from here. <clears throat> and this is characteristic of Sri He says, when I was my... During the process of my intellectual development, when I saw the truth of one idea, and after some time I saw the truth of the opposite idea, the prestige of the intellect was gone. <laughs> yeah. I remember his quote. Only that is true, the opposite of which is Absolutely. also true Absolutely. in its own time and application. Right. Absolutely. Yes. So you see now, this gives you a wideness. Yes. Yes. And most important, uh, from the individual point of view, you don't become easily judgmental. We human beings are always judging others, uh, putting a label on others. It is the biggest enemy of progress. Leave aside spirituality. Even intellectual development can't take place unless one is able to see all the sides. Then you can have your personal idiosyncrasy or discrimination. You can have yours and you can lean more. If I'm in power, I follow my idiosyncrasy. If you are in power, you follow your idiosyncrasy. Right? So this balancing is very important. This will lead you to the idea that mind is a very important instrument, but it is not an instrument of truth. So you have to go above mind. But, I can tell you that mind is not an instrument also in life. You can plan out anything that you want. I can guarantee you that tomorrow it will not work. You have to go on adjusting to life. And that needs a life intuition. And that's why Sri says the typical Indian mind plans out but at the same time is ready to abandon all his plans and adjust. But if you are intellectual, you plan out everything, <laughs> then it doesn't work, you crash. Yes. Let us take a break. <laughs> 